and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I look at the news and top-selling games from January 1988. I play Infocom games on my Spectrum. I play some games... ...and have a chat with Jeff. But first, it's the news. With movie tie-ins on the rise, the next big blockbuster has been grabbed by Gremlin Graphics, and they're damn proud of it too. Masters of the Universe is a massive film, with a lot of potential for merchandise, and many companies are jumping on the bandwagon, including Pizza Hut and the Daily Mirror. Gremlin claim the game will remain faithful to the film, with five key elements being used for different parts of the game. Amstrad are keeping tight-lipped about some reports of a new Spectrum Plus 2, the Plus 2A, as it's been labelled by some, apparently has the ability to use disk drives because it is based on the Plus 3 circuit board and contains the same operating system. There is also suggestion that it will include fewer chips, making it cheaper. But as usual, Amstrad are saying nothing. Two adventure games released by Mastertronic have serious bugs, which seems odd because the games were full retail packages not so long ago. Kentilla, originally released by Micromega, has two bugs, one stops the player from getting the dagger, and the other prevents Elva from killing Dag Vool. Mastertronic are refusing to admit there are any problems with Kentilla, but do admit there's an issue with another game for the Amstrad, Rigel's Revenge. They have agreed, though, to replace any games found to have problems. Elite's game Paperboy has been awarded Game of the Year at the Software Industry Awards. Other winners were Arkanoid, picking up the best arcade game, and BMX Simulator, getting best budget title. And that was the news. Now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Jack the Nipper 2 in Coconut Capers, a new nipper game from Gremlin Graphics, Mask, a cartoon tie-in, a game from Gremlin, Paperboy, the award-winning arcade conversion from Elite, and Gunship, the helicopter simulator from Microprose. And that was the news and top selling games from January 1988. Infocom produced some of the best text adventures ever to grace computers between 1977 and 1987. Other games were produced outside of these dates, and even after they were bought out by Activision in 1986. When Activision acquired the company and its games, there were rumours that they would push out versions for the latest ZX Spectrum, the Plus 3. Sadly, this never came to fruition, leaving us Spectrum owners with just Level 9 and Magnetic Scrolls for our adventuring fix. Infocom games were written by a tool named Zill, which stood for Zork Implementation Language, and this tool spat out byte code. This code could then be used on any machine that had a Z Machine virtual program. Z Machines were available for most of the popular computers and is still supported. There are versions for PCs, Macs, iOS, and even Android and Amiga. Around 2006, a Z Machine program was written for the Spectrum by John Elliott that supported most of the byte code versions. And using this, players could finally get their hands on some Infocom titles. I've tried to use this tool many times before in the past and each time I failed, but having a few days spare, I set about trying to get it to work. To be able to play Infocom games on your Spectrum Plus 3, you will need ZXZVM, the virtual interpreter from John Elliott's website, CPCFS, a CPC file system emulator, from anywhere you can find it, because the current link on WAS is broken. An Infocom game? These can be found if you search hard enough, but they must be in the .z5 format. SamDisk, a tool to write DSK images to real disks. You can get that from Simon Owen's website. A PC with an internal 3.5 inch disk drive. Some blank disks, of course. A Spectrum with an external or internal 3.5 inch drive. And a lot of time. Step 1. 
download and unzip the contents of the CPCFS zip file into a folder on your hard drive. Now it's very important to note that it will only run on 32-bit operating systems, so I had to use a virtual machine I had set up to get it working. Step 2. The game file. Once you have located the game of your choice, add it to the CPCFS folder. As mentioned before, the game has to be in .z5 format, but also be careful that it has to be version 3, 4, 5 or 8 of the Z Machine bytecode. You can find details about versions on the Infocom website. Step 3. Preparing the image. Using the command line, go to the CPCFS folder and enter CPCFS to enter the emulation mode and enter the command new, followed by the name of the disk you want to create. In this example, we're going to create a disk image called Planet. This will create an empty disk image already formatted and ready to use. To put the game file onto the image, you use the put command. So you type in put, in this case planet.z5, and this will copy the file to the image. You now close the image using the close command. Step 4. The Z Machine. Take the disk image that you've created and insert it into a Spectrum emulator of your choice. Do not try to run it, it won't work. You can check that everything's okay by typing cat and you should see the file. Now add the zxzvm.tap file to the emulator too, making sure that it doesn't eject the disk at the same time. Load the tap file and you will see the intro screen to zxzvm. It will ask you to enter a drive letter and in my case I enter A. You will now be shown files on the disk, in this case just Planetfall. You enter the name and press enter. You are now asked if you want 32 or 64 characters. Make your choice and the game should load. In the background the required files have also been copied to the disk. If you don't like the colour scheme you can change background and foreground colours by using Shift 6 and Shift 7. However, if you know a little bit about BASIC, you can edit the loader to do this for you. Step 5. Real Disks I have covered this before in episode 17, but you will need a PC with an internal 3.5 inch disk drive and SAM disk. The internal drive must also be set in the BIOS to a 360k 5.25 inch disk. Extract the contents of SAM disk zip into a folder copy the .dsk file into the same folder and using the command line enter samdisk and the name of the dsk file. In this example it's planet.dsk. Follow that by a colon to indicate which drive you want to write to and the data will now be written. Step 6. The real spectrum. Once complete remove the disk from the PC and insert it into the real spectrum. Using the same commands as before, you can now load the game. And there it is, a real Infocom game working on a real Spectrum. I've played Infocom games before on many different machines, so to get it onto the Spectrum finally is great. The 64 character mode can take a bit of reading, but it's absolutely brilliant that the games eventually made it. Scanner was originally released into the arcade by Sega in 1986. It was different from the usual arcade game in that it was actually an electronic pinball game. It simulated pinball, but there were no mechanical parts and it was a pinball simulator. In 1989 Electronic Art released the Spectrum version, and here it is. The game features several tables, but to get to them you have to complete certain tasks. If you want to win the game, you have to complete all of the tasks on all of the three tables. 
The first table is Volcano, and here you have to simply light up the letters to spell Volcano. To do this, you have to fire the ball into the central ramps, and these in turn are blocked by bumpers. So you have to hit the bumpers to drop them, fire the ball into the ramps to light up one letter, and keep going until you've finished. To release the ball, there is no emulation of the plunger. You simply hit one of the flipper keys when the plunger is in the place you want it, and the ball goes shooting off onto the table. The table itself is two screens high, and scrolls up and down when the balls move into that section. The ball movement though is sometimes a little odd, slowing down and speeding up, which can sometimes mean the difference between a good shot and losing a ball. The graphics are great. The well-drawn tables resemble the arcade ones, although the second table, Egypt, is a little cluttered due to the textured background. That is, if you can actually get there. I did manage it once. Gameplay is excellent. Apart from the ball speed issue, this really is a great pinball game for the Spectrum. There are bumpers, ramps, cushions, lights, buzzers, and the usual array of things to be found on pinball. Sound is good too, with some nice music playing in the background and some great sound effects. If you like pinball games, then this is certainly one of the best I've played on the Spectrum. The variety of tables is good, and each one has a different challenge. Everything comes together to make a great game then, and one I spent a long time playing. The only bad thing I can say about this is it didn't seem to like my Div IDE. It refused to load, and crashed the machine. So I had to go back to good old fashioned tape loading. Ah, the memories. Overall then, a great game that comes highly recommended. This is Maziacs from DKtronics, released in 1983. Originally released as Mazogs on the ZX81 by the same author, this was one of my all-time favourite games on both the ZX81 and the Spectrum. The game loads and you can view the instructions and a variety of options to make the game easier or harder. You can also choose the keys or use a joystick. The game is a brilliant mix of pathfinding and strategy, where you have to navigate a random maze in search of treasure. To help you find your way, there are prisoners, and when bumped into, will show you which direction to go. All is not well though, for guarding the treasure are the evil Mazogs, sorry, Maziacs. These beasts roam about in search of the unwary adventurer. Don't worry though, if you have a sword and good health, you may just come out of the fight a winner. Swords are collected from the maze walls, but you can only carry one at once, and once you've used it, it's gone, and you have to run around to find another one before another maziac pounces on you. As you fight, your health goes down, which can be seen on the right hand side, and to replenish it, you have to pick up food items, also to be found in the wall. As you wander around the maze, it scrolls in character squares, but this does not detract from the game at all. New areas of the maze become visible, and you have to creep around to make sure you don't go charging into any angry maziacs. You can view a larger view of the maze during play, or at least parts of it, and this helps you to locate prisoners, food, swords and maziacs. The graphics are large and well animated, and the fights are brilliant, comical and yet scary at the same time, especially if you are low on health and don't have a sword. The sound is used well too throughout the game, and it's just so engrossing. Once you get the treasure, it's not all over, because you have to take it back to the starting point, and the maziacs are back. 
This means you have to drop the treasure to pick up a sword, fight a Maziac, and if you win, pick the treasure up again and head off, being very careful. There is definitely tension in the air as you head back with the treasure, hoping not to come face to face with the Maziac, and the game isn't easy, but it's very enjoyable. Both this and the ZX81 game were written by Spectrum legend Don Priestley, and both are wonderful to play. Sadly, the Spectrum version does not give different levels of play like the ZX81 did. I particularly like the descriptions too, like Maniac Mobile Mazogs, which is more or less the Spectrum version, with free moving monsters. A brilliant game then, on either computer, and I can spend hours playing this game. In fact I did when reviewing it. Superb. This episode's new game is Code Zero, written by myself and released in 2017. I have been called out before for reviewing my own games, so this time I'm not actually going to say anything about it other than the story, and I'll let you make up your own mind. The game is free of charge, no cost. No in-app purchases, no DLC, a full game for free. Just wanted to make that point. First the story. The game is set in the future, and there has been a mistake at a power station, set up to test new power sources. Having rushed into things, it's now discovered that the whole thing was a massive mistake, and the power station could implode, taking the entire planet with it. A Code Zero message was broadcast, and you were the nearest agent. Your task is to locate the main computer room and insert a virus into the machine to disable everything. To do this, you have to use the lift to access different floors, collect keys that open doors, and eventually make your way to the computer. The game has a slower pace than my usual games, so it's more of an explore, collect and use game. If you like the look of it, give it a try, it's free. This is Invasion Force, released by Arctic Computing in 1982. Originally released by Arctic for the ZX81 in the same year, Invasion Force is a mix of arcade games, but mostly resembles the last level of Phoenix. The ZX81 version was fun to play, and for the Spectrum release, the author has changed very little. The idea is simple, you have to destroy the large mothership at the top of the screen. To do this you first have to shoot holes in the force field, then shoot holes in the rotating ship, and then hit the middle of the ship itself. Things are made difficult though through a variety of different things. Firstly, each time you shoot the force field three bombs drop down. Secondly, if you hit one of the marked areas in the force field, any damage already done to the mothership is repaired. And lastly, there are some aliens that randomly shoot at you. The graphics are quite bland to be honest, but they do their job and move smoothly enough, which is unusual for a 16k game. The mothership is a bit blocky and looks like a straight copy of the ZX81 version. Sound is well used with some nice effects too. If you get hit, a lorry with the Arctic Computing logo drives up, refuels you and lets you carry on. A nice touch I thought.
When you first start the game, there's an option for a suicidal game. This just ramps up the speed and number of bombs, and is definitely a challenge. It would have been nice not to have those in-between screen effects, and they soon get boring. But overall, if you can ignore the graphics, this is a nice little game, and definitely worth a quick blast. to hardware right this could be this could be long this could be a double episode this could be and and, <laughs> and we're doing new hardware aren't we we're doing new hardware yes. this time so new hardware yeah, yeah. i've collected them all together actually this morning all of the new things that i've got i have a div ide yep i think that's probably the most common purchased new piece of hardware I would have thought. yep uh, you're probably right actually um, I, I think there's quite a lot of them out there um mm. an interface one bis which I'm particularly interested in because I haven't got one of those. A Div MMC. Yep. A ZXC3. Never heard of that. I'll tell you about that in a bit as well. A smart card. Yeah, I've got one of those. Yeah, they're great. Well, let's start with the interface one biz then. Go on then. Um, I don't know very much about it. Is it? Um, does it emulate microdrives using the same Pretty much. built-in commands? Yes. Yeah. To my so knowledge, it does. I've never had a microdrive, so I haven't got an interface one. I haven't yeah. got a a microdrive never used one but from what i know yes it does because I was, I was looking at, at one point i was looking to buy it um because of because of the read write capabilities using standard rom calls rather than using exodus or residos yep. on the div mcs and i thought that was a good idea and then i also noticed that they've, they've got an add-on board for ethernet connection as well they have i haven't got that so the, the interface one biz, so you can, it's, it's like a microdrive image. That's quite good in, in so far as you, you could feasibly run it with a real spectrum and anything that was microdrive compatible, it would work then. Yeah. I think the interface one bis is the best all-rounder. Right. If the interface one bis, you can take snapshots. I think it's the only other thing. I think the div IDA and MMC, you can take snapshots. You can't on the smart card. You definitely can't on the ZXC3. And the disk, only if it's supported by the game you're running the three and a half inch floppy but like Mm. i said that probably doesn't count as new hardware you can do that on the interface one bis but you can do so much more because you can you can connect it to your computer and then you or you or the or use the ethernet add-on and that will then let you go to world of spectrum and just play any game at all from the world of spectrum archive right which is is that is is that using what the usb connector yeah because that that was another thing that interested me i mean it connects I presume it'll connect to your computer and then what use your connect uh, use your computer's internet connection. Yep. Um, Sounds good. How how is how is that sort of shown on screen? But is there a, is there an interface or do you have to type stuff in? There is. You when you when you first boot it up, it's a bit fiddly. So it's the best all rounder. I think it's the best all rounder of every everything, but it is a bit fiddly to use. Actually, it scores above the Div ID and the MMC in that it'll work with my rubber keyed Spectrum as well. Um. Hmm. Uh, but you can take snapshots with it. You can you can actually save what you do and take a snapshot with it. One of the disadvantages is because it emulates the micro drive. The SD card doesn't um, doesn't just use a fat th- a fat sixteen or thirty two bit format. So it's um, hard to get what's on your card off without the right. PC connection. But it's a great little okay. device. And am, am I right in thinking that you can also? set up your PC as like a, a mini server for the USB thing? Yes, you can. Right. So Sounds interesting. Sounds a lot of, lot of good th- lot of good things to play with. And and I'm just looking at the specs now. It's got a PS2 keyboard um, connection and a Kempston joystick stroke mouse connector. Yep. Um, I haven't tried yeah. the keyboard. I've got a PS2 keyboard. I might put, that would be really good, actually. Um, I might try with the PS2 keyboard. The, the other card, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is Spectranet, yep. um, which I hope you've got some information for, because I haven't. <laughs> but Spectronet's um, Dylan, isn't it? Um, the guy yeah. from the mm-hmm. forums who used to yeah. go to Play Expo. Yes, who, that's right. Who always, set up yep. them tank games. Yep. Yes, he did. Um, you could play play across the net. No, I've I've not got a Spectronet. Um, I'd like one. I'd like one. To, just to, I was hoping that somebody would come up with a really basic web browser. That you could use just text based, no you know, no picture conversions, and then you could use it on the internet just for a laugh. <laughs> you could. <laughs> I don't know, you have to take the text in, in small lumps, maybe ten K take the you know, take the HTML down ten K at a time, mm. remove all the all the formatting and coding and then just output the text. 
bit by bit to screen like a scroll, like the old scrolling bulletin boards. Sounds like, sounds like you've got a design, Paul. You'll have to make one. <laughs> it, it, it can't be beyond the realms of man, but, <laughs> but not, owning a, not owning an interface, then I, I wouldn't be able to do it. All, all donations welcome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a, another new interface called a Spectra, not a Spectra net, a Spectra mm. that offers SCART output as well as um, extra display modes, 64 colours, uh, an additional ROM socket if you want mm. it. So that's that's the another... Another new piece of hardware, which is good. That's from the ZX Resource Center, which I'll, I'll put links up for all of these anyway. Yeah. That looks good because obviously it extends the display modes of the Spectrum. So you get things like, you know, the Nirvana engine and multicolored modes. It will give you all those in hardware as well as additional colors. And the ROM socket as well, so it will act like a Interface 2. Okay, oh, cool. Ah, and there's, there's a, so the, the one thing what? I haven't talked about that was different from yours was the, was the ZX C3. Yes, what is that? I've never heard it of that. It is, you know, the ROM cartridges, you know, Jetpack and all the 16-bit yeah. ROM cartridges. Hmm. It's one of the, it, it's one of those, but bigger, that you have to flash. Right. So it's from by a guy called Paul Farrell. Ah, um, yes, Fruitcake. Yeah, Fruitcake. <laughs> that, I'm not calling him a name, by the way. <laughs> that's that's the URL for his website. Yeah, fruitcake.plus.com. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, and I got I got it. I bought it years ago. It can be a bit fiddly when you want to reflash it. You've got to. I've got. I got mine with a case, and you've got to take it out of the case, move some jumpers around, and that kind of thing. You actually load the ROMs. You flash the ROMs to the card, and then just put it in your interface two or Turbo RAM interface. Right. And when you turn it on, you just get a menu up, and you just select whatever games you put on there from the menu. There's a little program on your Spectrum that creates a loader for you and you actually use the it's a it's a tip the tape interface so basically you right, plug okay. something into your your socket in your computer and into the socket of the spectrum and you you flash it from there so do, does it get over the 16k limit then because it does. obviously it the, the original it. roms could only do 16k it does it. so you can put you can put full 48k games on yeah them. you can put full 48k games and you're better off using the z80 format because they're then compressed and smaller and how, how many games can you get on it then? um oh, i can't i think this is 128k from memory but it might be slightly bigger than that i can't remember exactly how big it is so, so you can get what five six yeah games you can get about five six games tops so, so so i presume if you use 16k games you can get more than if you start putting 48k games yeah. on them or, or is there a limited number of slots? Or is no, no. It just, it's, make, it's, just keep going until you've used Yeah, as it. many slots as you can. Um, oh, and right. then there's a, there's, a, there's a reflasher program that you can put on there as well to make it easier to reflash. It's it's a little bit of a novelty. It's quite a good, uh, good little device, actually. It was a wet and misty day when Blackpool hosted their 6th Expo event, and a slight miscalculation had me arriving an hour early. But after a bacon butty, I eventually got into the large hall and took a look around. The event is larger than Revival, the event I attended in Birmingham earlier in the year, but it wasn't quite as large as the one held in Manchester in October. There were plenty of classic arcade cabs, and it was easy to get a game on these throughout the weekend. All set to free play, I tested my skills on a lot of them, including Galaga, Gyrus, Nemesis, Power Drift, Asteroids, and numerous others. Sadly, the volume of the machines was very low, meaning it was impossible to hear most of the games you were playing. Gyrus, for example, I played without hearing anything at all. The hall was loud, though, with a mix of pinball, arcade, PC, and console gaming noise. There were plenty of classic consoles and retro computers set up too, but sadly only two Spectrums. One was stuck on Cookie, at least I couldn't get the Div ID to select anything else, and a Plus machine that seemed to have Manic Miner always playing. The other machines were too numerous to mention by name, but they included VIC-20s, Commodore 64s, Vectrex, BBC, Master Systems, Mega Drives, and a whole lot more. There was a separate room for sellers, but again, no Spectrum games. At least, that I could find. I was very tempted to buy an Amiga 1500 with a monitor, going for just £100, but with no guarantee it would work, I left it. I did, however, pick up a good condition ZX printer, complete with manual and original reel of paper, complete with Sinclair emblem. 
I have one of these on loan from Jeff at the moment for a review, but I wanted one of my own, and this was a decent price. There were also a series of talks hosted by the Retro Hour guys across the weekend, with guests like Gary Bracey from Ocean Software talking about the company, the games, and the packs he put together. Obviously, it was like a huge story in the industry then. I mean, did that kind of affect Ocean? Obviously, a lot of their and David Pleasance, head of Commodore UK, who told stories of the Amiga years. I admit that I'm absolutely a, a technical dumbass. <laughs> These were interesting to attend, and it was there that I bumped into quite a few people, like Mark Jones, the ex-Ocean graphic artist, and Dan from Lemon Amiga. All in all, it was a good event. Plenty to do, easy access of the machines, and good breakout sessions. I enjoyed my time there, and now I'm looking forward to play Manchester in October. <laughs>